All right, so this is a suggestion via Discord. The name of the video is uh, Missing People Cases That Still Remain Unsolved. Uh, all right. Guys, we're here. Let's check it out. Let's see if we can solve some of these or attempt to. Number five. 53-year-old Gary Watson Shearer from okay. Renfrew, Scotland, disappeared okay. just hours after he had arrived in the area of Lensrote in celebration of St. Patrick's Day on the 17th of March. He had checked into a hotel in Puerto del Carmen and headed to Bar 67 right after. CCTV footage captured Gary lying unconscious in a doorway around 1.30 the following morning. A search was conducted of the area but to no avail. Recently though, new CCTV footage emerged showing Gary walking with an unidentified individual. Okay, so now we know he was highly intoxicated. According to Gary's niece, Darcy Shearer, the authorities had contacted the family about the footage. They stated that they were unsure if this was a brief encounter or something more than that. Previous CCTV footage had shown Gary in a jovial mood and mixing with a group of six other people at the pub the evening that he disappeared. Gary had been officially reported missing when he failed to show up for his flight back home. Gary's parents, Anne and Danny, as well as his sister Michelle, had flown out to Lanzarote to assist in the search. His family has also been critical about the police, stating that there was a lack of support in the weeks that followed his disappearance. Darcy stated that they're trying to keep his face and name out there in hopes that someone may recognize him or know anything about his whereabouts. A Facebook page called Find Gary Shearer was created as well, and one post read, quote, Sorry for the lack of posts, there's been very little to update you all on. The new footage is said to be released to the press and hopefully more information may come through regarding this man's whereabouts. Furthermore, Gary is said to suffer from epilepsy as well as type 2 diabetes. He also walks with a limp and had been wearing a green and white Celtic football top, white shorts and shoes at the time of his disappearance. He's said to be 5 feet and 2 inches tall and has graying or black hair. Several searches have been carried out in the area in an effort to locate the missing man. All right, guys. So really quickly, um, yeah, it's all it's definitely on Facebook. Um, I can definitely see this here. Uh, they are still, in fact, posting uh, posted as of yesterday at six uh, six sixteen p.m. Um, this happened in the Canary Islands in Spain. It's uh, missing since March sixteenth. The 16th of March, 2023. Stated that should anyone have any information regarding this man, they're to make contact with the Civil Guards people and homicide team in Las Palmas. Additionally, you're encouraged to contact 077-22-094-907 or 073-05-243-618 or the local police. Gary Shearer's sister also stated that it feels empty without her brother around. As time moves on, concerns grow about the well-being of this missing person. With enough media coverage, the family hopes that Gary will soon turn up and believe that he is somewhere out there. The unidentified male in the CCTV footage has also not come forward with information. He can be seen in a light-colored shirt and dark pants. Efforts to find the man are still being stressed, and his case remains open and unsolved to this day for the time being. Okay, right, so when this video was suggested to me, I was like, "Hmm, don't know if I should do this one, right?" So my um, uh, my my project manager, she uh, she actually uh, previewed this video and said it's not that it's not exploitative. So I was like, "Okay, cool, we'll do it." Um, and now like, it makes all the sense in the world. So guys, if you have encountered this person in any means, the number was uh on the um you know on on the video a couple of moments ago, guys. Right? Let's check it out. Let's continue. Number four. Because I definitely don't like when people suggest me things that are like super odd, guys. Like someone suggested me one time, um, like it was a paid donation, and I was just like, guys, why would you send this to me? Um, what was it? Uh, it was like two. No, it was like a snake. Two snakes, like eating, and I was just like, I don't really want to see snakes. Why? Why? Why do you want me to see snakes consuming a live animal? A little weird. I don't want to see that. But either way. Trevor Dealey was born to Michael and Anne Dealey on the 15th of August, 1978. He had grown up in Nas, Ireland in County Kildare. He was the youngest out of four children. Trevor is said to be very close with his family, but was the closest with Mark, his older brother. 
He had gone on to study business at the Waterford Institute of Technology, but dropped out and struggled to find his calling. He then decided to take a computer course in Dublin that was concluded in 1999. After he had graduated, he had many job offers, but had decided to work in the IT department for the Bank of Ireland Asset Management. On the 7th of December 2000, Trevor was attending a Christmas party for his office at Buck Whaley's nightclub that was close to the bank at which he worked. The party had gone on until the early hours of the morning. It's believed that he had departed at around half past three in the morning. It had been raining that evening, and there had been a taxi worker strike, so he had to walk home. The bank was still open at the time, and so he decided to grab his umbrella before venturing on a 20-minute walk to his apartment in the Ballsbridge neighborhood. Before embarking on his journey, he had some tea and spoke with one employee, Carl Pender. It was only around four that he began to make his journey. During the walk, he phoned Glenn Cullen, his friend, but left a voicemail because the friend had already been asleep. This was the last time that anyone had heard from Trevor. The following day, he had not shown up for work and his co-workers, as well as his boss, found this to be urgent and concerning. Other employees had also been upset that day. That weekend, none of his friends and family had heard from him either, even though he had made plans with them. It's assumed that he was just busy. When Monday came, Trevor still had not shown, and this is when the urgency had kicked in. Mark had then received a phone call regarding his brother's status. He received a phone call from his mother that Monday, and she was frantic. The bank soon reported Trevor missing, and the search for him began. Mark was dedicated to finding his missing brother after he had not returned home for over two months. Authorities managed to obtain CCTV footage from the bank as well as other nearby businesses. The cameras captured some chilling inferences. At five minutes past three that morning, a man who was wearing dark attire was seen heading toward the bank's gate and stood behind a pillar. It appeared as though he was trying to hide and stayed there for about 30 minutes. At 34 minutes past three, the man answered a phone call. This is when Trevor entered into frame, also on a phone call with the man he would be having a cup of tea with. Once he arrived at the second gate, the unidentified man revealed himself, and the two had spoken briefly. Trevor entered his workplace, and soon another two men appeared at the gate, staring through it. But oh, they were no. later found to be co-workers, and okay. had been cleared okay. as suspects. Okay. Okay. The mystery man eventually walked out of frame. At 4 a.m., Trevor left the bank and... Yeah, but now this mystery man knows he has a key. ...headed for his apartment. 14 minutes later, he's seen passing by an ATM close to Haddington Road and Baggett Street Bridge. About 30 seconds later, the mystery man reappeared and was seen heading quickly in the same direction as Trevor. Trevor's friends and family had handed out flyers and went door to door in an effort to find the missing man. He's since been missing for 23 years and would now be 45 years old. He's said to be six foot three inches tall. He had red or blonde hair and green eyes. At the time, he had a thin build and is said to have had a distinctive gait and walked with his arms straight down. He'd been wearing a yellow and brown shirt with beige pants and had a blue ACC golf umbrella. Should anyone have any information regarding the whereabouts of this man, they're encouraged to contact Crime Stoppers oh, at 1-800-250-025. Yeah, guys, I, you know, really quickly, I was just looking up to see if there was anything that I could find online about it. And he just basically said every single bit of the information. There was literally nothing. There's, there's nothing else here. Um, oh, wow. But I would only expect, I mean, based off of the footage itself, I mean, who would know uh, exactly who that person was? You can't, there's just nothing distinguishing about the person, like, like at all. Guys. The case was reopened in 2016. <laughs> And another anonymous tip was received in 2017 okay. that stated they know what happened to Trevor. According to the tipster, the man who followed Trevor was part of a local gang who wanted to gain access to the bank. They suggested that Trevor had been buried in Dublin, but after several weeks of digging, no body was discovered. It was then suggested that the tip may have been based on a mistaken identity. The search was called off, and to this day, Trevor Dewey remains a missing person. I mean, that sounds plausible because, again, why are you sitting next to the gate, uh, the gate of a bank? Like, you know, he has the key and then 
you see him walking through the camera, then out of nowhere you see the guy chasing behind him, guys. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we kind of know where this went, unfortunately. Uh, but if there's no body, then there's no case, I guess, right? Number three. That's Michaela crazy, Margaret Kim Bali went missing on the 12th of April, 2016. She was born on the 2nd of July in 1999 and would now be 23 years old. Michaela has been missing for seven years. At 41 minutes past six in the morning on the 12th of April, Michaela messaged her friend, Ascana, and asked if she could drive her to the bank, stating that she had $5,000 in her account. Upon oh, no. investigating, authorities found that this wasn't true. Okay. Ascana had declined. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, let's not say how much money you have in your bank. Like specifically, if you can't be the one that that's going to be driving to the bank itself, like yeah, let's not tell people how much money you have in the bank. Because. And at 20 minutes past eight, Michaela attended her classes at Sacred Heart High School. She would then go on to exit through a back entrance and make her way to the bank between 8.50 and 8.55. The bank had captured her on CCTV talking to someone on the phone, but when the bank teller opened the shutters, she had quickly ended the phone call. She then drew $55 from her account. Not long after, she had entered a pawn shop to pawn a silver ring, but the owner refused it. The next time Michaela was caught on CCTV footage was when she entered a combined Tim Hortons and Wendy's restaurant at a quarter past nine. She had ordered a drink and sat in a booth with her backpack alongside her. During her stay at the apartment, she had been nervously looking at the entrance. After a few minutes, Michaela got up and placed her backpack on her back. But she'd not had this bag at school, and this led investigators to believe that she could have been planning to leave Yorktown, Saskatchewan, right. in Canada. At 23 minutes past 9, she exited through one of the exits only to immediately re-enter and use a different exit. She then returned to the Tim Hortons and Wendy's restaurant at... Yeah, guys, it looks like she's looking for a ride. 9.49, while on the phone with someone who's yet to be identified. She then sat at a booth that faced the door. At 12 minutes past 10, Michaela messaged her friend Shelby, saying that she needed help, only to retract it and say that she had figured it out. At 43 minutes past 10, she asked a woman for a room at her hotel, but she refused. Two minutes later, she left the cafe while on the phone again. Between the times of 10.45 and 11.55, Michaela's whereabouts are not known, but she then re-entered the high school around noon that day. She'd met up with two friends and told them that she would be taking a bus to Regina. It was believed that she was possibly carrying two phones when inside the school. At two minutes past 12, she left the high school and went to the bus depot. She discovered that the bus she wanted to use was only departing at five in the afternoon, and so she left. She later returned to the UFC bus depot and had a meal at the trail stop restaurant. There were no CCTV cameras that had captured her there. Sometime after one in the afternoon, she had exited the depot but had never come home. Later that evening, she was reported missing. By the following morning, her phone was turned off. Authorities don't think that Michaela purchased a ticket, and after leaving the depot, her whereabouts are unknown. Guys, she ran away. All right, I mean, uh, I understand it's terrible, for the parents, obviously, I would hate to have one of my children just run away and be like, listen, I'm leaving. I'm done with this, guys. But she's 16. I'm going to go ahead and guess she ran away, guys. That's kind of where I'm leaning. Um, uh, I don't know if they came up with that also, but probably. Because everything sounds like she packed her bags and was just like, I'm done with uh, Saskatchewan, Canada. It's too cold. I'm telling you. She came to America, I'm guessing. There have been numerous sightings of this missing woman, which have been as recent as 2019. But unfortunately, these tips would come in too late. Too late. Two months after her disappearance, Michaela had posted on social media with a picture of a Snapchat profile, stating that she's looking for some Snapchat friends because she didn't have any in real life. Authorities suspect that she'd made contact with someone the day she went missing and planned to meet them within that month. Additionally, a man who had a flaming cross tattoo was seen with Michaela, but it's now believed that he was just holding a door for her and he's not considered a suspect. It was found that the missing woman was messaging a man named Christopher. She had told her friends that she would be visiting him in Saskatchewan. 
Police officers had searched Christopher's home but found no evidence that he'd been in Canada at the time that Michaela disappeared. After some further investigation, it was found that she was possibly messaging other individuals through an app called Kick, where messages remain private. There's speculation that she may have met with someone whom she met through that app or she was kidnapped. Michaela is described as having blonde shoulder length hair and blue eyes. Guys, we do have a trafficking problem. Understand that. Uh, she's young. Oh, God. At the time of her disappearance, she was said to weigh 140 pounds. She has chicken pox scars on her forehead and a birthmark the size of a dime on the right side of her jaw. Michaela had a mole on the right side of her chin and protruding front teeth as well as a scar on her left hand. She has a fair complexion and a thin build. The missing woman is said to wear teal rimmed glasses and it's stated that should anyone have any information regarding her whereabouts, that they contact the local Saskatchewan police at 306-641-9436. Additionally, you can also email... Guys, this is somebody's kid. ...miraclemichaela at gmail.com if you have any information. Number two. Wow. 30 like, this is this is terrible, guys. This is like seriously terrible. I, I would never want to personally have to go through this. I don't want you guys to go through this, neither. Right? I don't want anyone to go through this. Good. <laughs> that last one is, is heart wrenching, though. Seriously, because I have a I have a sixteen year old son, and I I'm not sure that I'd be like, you know what? Yeah. Three years ago, like on the first like of June, nineteen ninety, twenty four year old Connie Lynn Royce disappeared. Connie had walked into the Hayloft Bar in Mount Clemens barefooted and was never seen or heard from again. Surveillance footage had captured the young woman making her way into the bar with two men who had been her date and his friend at the time. This is where she was last seen. The video shows that the three individuals were showing their identification in order to access the bar. Later on, caught on the same camera, she can be seen exiting the bar alone where she hits her shoulder against the wall accidentally. Strangely, she had taken her shoes but left her purse behind. It stated that a possible sighting of her was seen from across the street where she was using a payphone that same night. It's noted that parked nearby, there had been a 1970s model car, but it's not been confirmed if she had gotten into it or not, but ever since, Connie has been a missing person. It was determined that at the time of her disappearance, she had been living with her parents after a short marriage and had been dating a man before she disappeared. The relationship had to come to an end. The bar in question is situated in the 100 block of North Gratiot in Mount Clements. On this day, Connie was going on a date with an individual named Greg, whom she met a few days prior. The two met at his apartment and then headed to Hayloft, where the friend, Brad, had joined them. The staff at the bar stated that the three individuals were behaving normally throughout the evening and there was no argument or any unusual event happening at the table at which they sat. Around 11 that evening, Connie's date had gone to the restroom. Suddenly, Connie had gotten up and said that she needed to get away. She left without her black purse, but took her shoes with her. Camera footage revealed her leaving 50 minutes after she had arrived. Upon watching the video, Connie's family believed that she may have gotten spiked. A few minutes later, both men who accompanied her had gone outside to look for her, only to return moments later, where they decided to wait inside for her return. Guys, that's extremely plausible. But by two the next morning, Connie still had not shown up. Her vehicle had been left at her date's apartment, Sterling Heights, that evening, and that's where it was found later. As for the unconfirmed payphone sighting, authorities had tried to access the records of it, but it had not been successful. Witnesses later reported that they'd seen a woman who resembled Connie at Newport Apartments in Clinton Township a few days after she had gone missing. After police investigated this claim, it was found that the woman the witnesses had seen was not the one they were looking for. The two men who Connie had been with that evening were interviewed and then cleared as suspects. Additionally, an arrest was made of a man named Leslie Williams after he confessed to four homicides in eastern Michigan. Oh! It was initially speculated that he may have had something to do with the disappearance of Connie, but he had been in prison at the time. Both Connie's ex-boyfriend and ex-husband were interviewed and were cleared as suspects as they both had alibis. It's noted that when Connie and her recent ex-boyfriend had broken up, she had left barefoot. 
some theorized that she may have wandered down to Clinton River, which was nearby to the bar. Authorities searched the river, but no clues were found. It's believed that she'd been spiked and abducted due to the sighting of her at the payphone. Yeah, that's what it sounds like the, the more we go on and on about this, guys. Um, I'm guessing it was 32 years ago, so I'm going to go ahead and guess uh, 91, maybe? 1990, somewhere in there, guys? And it's then been suggested that she called someone to pick her up. And it's then thought that either that person never came to get her, or they did and something had gone wrong. Connie Royce was born on the 22nd of September, 1965. At the time of her disappearance, she was said to have weighed around 120 pounds and was five feet, three inches tall. When she disappeared, Connie was wearing a black sleeveless form-fitted mini dress, which had a flower print on the skirt. One of the strangest features of her case is that she was barefoot. Yeah, that's Connie was odd. a Caucasian female who had sandy shoulder length hair at the time of her disappearance. And she's also said to have had blue eyes. She allegedly has two tattoos, one of them has names and a heart on her right shoulder, while the other is a bumblebee found on her right wrist. She also has her ears pierced and is featured with a gap between her front teeth. Connie's maiden name is said to be Bostic, and in various accounts, her known surname, Royce, is spelled with an S. Connie would now be about 56 years old, and her case remains unsolved. If anyone has any information regarding this missing woman, you're urged to contact the Macomb County Sheriff's Office at 586-307-9358 or 586-469-5151 with the agency case number 0562590. Her name- Guys, have any of these cases ever been found? Guys, because these are very grim, all, all of them. Uh, I'm guessing definitely the spiking of the drink. Uh, absolutely, guys. Um, why didn't she have any shoes on also? Like there, it's odd. The case it's, number it's very odd. is 5414, and her NCIC case number reads as M5182647624762. Number one. Cat videos now or something, guys. On the 17th of August, 2017, Hop Van Nguyen, a 32-year-old, disappeared in Grand Prairie, Texas, never to be seen or heard from again. Hop was born on the 11th of December in 1984. At the time of his disappearance, he weighed 165 pounds and stood at a height of 5 feet and 11 inches tall. He's characterized as an Asian male with black hair and brown eyes. He's said to have a scar behind his right ear, and the very tip of his right index finger is missing. Additionally, he has a half sleeve dragon tattooed on his right arm and the letters TFT on the inside of his right arm. He's also of Vietnamese descent. Hop was last seen on State Highway 161, driving a white Nissan 350Z convertible. He exited Lower Tarrant Road in Grand Prairie at around a half past 10 on the evening of the 17th of August. Later, this vehicle had been found abandoned. The eerie part of this entire case. Yeah, I'm not sure he would abandon a, a convertible 3, 350Z, bro. All right, so, so something obviously nefarious happened. Comes in with the doorbell camera footage. In a one minute and two second long video, an unidentified male wearing dark clothing and a cap can be seen backing up toward the door where they then place a piece of paper over the doorbell camera. For the rest of the video, the paper and a part of the wall is all one can see. The detectives right. involved in this case have not confirmed if they suspect foul play or not. This is foul play. This is, I, I'm not sure they need, they need to at all to confirm if they think that this is foul play. This is foul play. But Hop's family and friends are concerned that the man was abducted after viewing the security footage that was taken on the evening that he disappeared. Additionally, after the paper is placed before the camera, the sound of loud fiddling noises can be heard as though the lock is being picked, and then the opening of a door can be heard. A few words can be heard spoken, but it's uncertain as to what was said. Some have suggested the man was speaking over a two-way radio. Footsteps can be heard approaching next, and the paper is pushed further against the camera to ensure that his identity is not captured. This incredibly creepy video only supports the idea that he'd been kidnapped. His family yeah. believe that Hop is in great danger. One yeah. family member, Shally Nguyen, 
stated that they hoped that someone had seen his car or him around the time of his disappearance, and that any information they received at this point would be helpful. Some individuals who have seen the footage believe that the perpetrator is a skilled criminal, and his lock yeah. picking sounded rather trained as well. Some also believe that the man was communicating with someone else and not operating alone. This case appeared on the subreddit Unsolved Mysteries, and some Redditors believe that this seemingly organized crime has something to do with one of the largest Japanese criminal groups that's rather well known for the repercussions that may occur. They support this theory by referring to the missing fingertip, but it's been noted that Hop is not Japanese, and therefore this likely isn't the case. What does this tattoo mean? One individual suggested that it may be a different organized crime group that carried out the abduction of the missing man, if that is the case. It's also believed that someone within Hop's inner circle possibly knows what happened to him and is keeping quiet about it out of fear or the belief that it's a safer option if this is some sort of gang-related incident. Most likely. While there has been some speculation among those interested in the case as to what the lettering on his arm means, nothing of that nature has been confirmed as of yet. Hop certainly disappeared under very suspicious circumstances that evening that he went missing. Should anyone have any information regarding this missing man, you're urged to make contact with the Grand Prairie Police Department at 972-237-8790. The agency case number is 170001-7223. Finding Hop Van Nguyen is certainly an urgent matter as he may be an endangered individual. It's not been determined who was the last person to see him. His case is still open and under investigation with hopes that useful tips are brought in that would aid in locating this missing man. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date. Okay, 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 enough. Oh my, all right, guys, the last one, the last one, the guy Hop Van Nugen, right? Um, I think he specifically is not here any longer um, and, you're, and we're not gonna find him. Uh, I'm not trying to be callous here. I'm just not sure we're going to find him. Okay. I'm not sure, guys. Mm, that is That was too crazy. Imagine. This is also why I'm, I'm seriously an advocate for uh, having multiple cameras. I mean, sure, the ring doorbell camera is great, you know, but it, it doesn't hurt to have another uh, camera facing the front from from somewhere else, right? It, it definitely does not hurt, right? Um, but that one there was crazy. Do I think that it's uh, like some street fraternity related thing? Probably, all right, uh, absolutely. Maybe he was racing his 350Z because most people that would even think about owning one of those type of vehicles are probably, right, nismoing it up, right? Um, and they're doing street races and maybe he couldn't pay his loss. And they were like, listen, you have, you have one day to pay your loss. So we're coming for you. That's what that sounds like. Hmm? Just a, just a thought here. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> that was a wild one. But all right, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day and enjoy your day thoroughly.